Hi again, everybody. Uh, I'm going I'm to show a few images from a project I worked on. Of course, I'm going to set my time. <coughs> I'm going to show a few images from a project that I worked on from about 2005 to 2010 to give you an idea of where I've come from, and then I'm going to talk about the project that I'm working on right now. So Arctic Listening Post is an interdisciplinary research-based collaborative exploration of the effects of climate change and our understanding and imagination of the North Pole and Arctic. And it includes a number of different works, including um, this project, Transforming Images from an NOAA webcam placed at the North Pole, into an elegiac film about loss, gathering stories and data from explorers' journals, both then and now, and glaciologist data to create narrative visualizations as a gift to a dying landscape, creating an online commons, a networked conversation with scholars, scientists, theologians, journalists, and others studying the Arctic and climate change, and open to museum goers um, in a participatory experiment. And imagining, with an architect, Mitchell Joachim, the future of the North Pole after a three meter sea level rise in the next century in a fantastical film about cities become nomadic eco -terrian. So but my current project looks at what's happening now in our backyards. So instead of speculating about future cataclysmic change, I look at ecosystem affects, adaptation, and resiliency all in the effort of connecting us more deeply to the natural world in which we live. What better way to do this than looking at birds, those longtime symbols of our higher selves full of freedom and possibility. There are over 81 million birders in our country, with an estimated economic impact of $2 billion. Who knew? <laughs> Clearly, birds matter to us. But birds also matter to their landscapes. How? What will happen as they arrive late or don't arrive at all? What will their predators eat? Questions like that. How can we understand more about the effects of climate change in our backyards by considering this role that birds play in the ecosystem? So the project pairs works with the museum, public works with a museum installation that acts as a kind of participatory research station. It will examine four sites, one in each of the major migratory flyways of North America each of which will have its own avian research station designed in response to the species and landscape of the site. The public works consist of a series of flags. In this case, an early prototype, flags of shorebirds um, that ultimately will be in the Pacific coast um, in various states of near extinction, questionable extinction, that's a fine line. Uh, like this Eskimo curlew, or scarcity, like the roseate tern, or a leech's storm petrel. Um, the, what you're reading on those flags is the phonetic translation of the bird's calls, so you can sound those out to yourself. <laughs> All right, we don't have time for that. Never mind. Um, and then they hang in habitats once populated um, by disappearing birds, like warehouses, backyards, and power stations. So each site will have a different set of flags, as well as a different research station design. Um, and these flags look at how birds communicate with each other and how they communicate within their landscapes. So another set is going to be located in the Western Flyway, one that goes right up in the middle of the continent um, at a, actually I'm gonna keep on my reading and not ad lib. Okay, um, in the southeastern Arizona and into Mexico in the Chiricahua Mountains, spreading out from a ranch called Puente Los Ojos, where conservationists are working to translate desertified terrain like this into biodiverse riparian habitat. The flags at this site explore how desert grassland sparrows, such as the grasshopper sparrow, hide in habitats extreme, extremely stressed by ranching invasives and desertification caused by climate change. Intricately stitched handmade flags hang on cattle ranch fences, gas stations, and restored grasslands, and they create a kind of camouflage version of the markings of each sparrow's wing hives. These sparrows are known as LBJs, the little brown jobs. It's really hard to tell them apart or find them at all. And so they have this incredibly effective um, camouflage. On the eastern flyway, a bit closer to home, I've been birding at Great Meadows. Concord's a great place to do this work with its long history of famous naturalists. These are samples from Throw, and the prevalence of local naturalists today. This is also Great Meadows. On this side, I'm looking at birds who are affected by shifts in temperature, based in part on the scientific research of one of our participants, Libby Elwood, sitting up at the front. 
Um, uh, uh, so, and I'm looking at birds like the yellow rumped warbler, one of the most sensitive. It has the greatest variance in arrival time based on temperature change. So, um, and there's our friend, the yellow rumped warbler. So, explorations of the reasons and aspects of these small changes in our ecosystem will take place in bird lines. They become research stations, field research stations. And this reimagined bird blind is modeled after Thoreau's famous home. There it is, in both the frontispiece and in its plan, not from this time, clearly. And the installation will be a platform for participatory research, drawing together scientists, local naturalists, historical data, online data, and field research trips. And it will unfold over the front of the exhibition and will engage the many habitats, both natural and man-made, that comprise Concord, even a nail salon. Inside this bird blind, one thing I'm working on is creating a muir web visualization of the Concord ecosystem as a database backend for various artworks. Muir webs, innovated by landscape ecologist Eric Sanderson for his Manhattan project, are simply a visualization of the interactions between species in a defined location, much like a social network. So I started to think recently about how to build a muir web of Concord's ecosystem. How to develop, to use it as a way to understand the key issues of connectivity and fragmentation of resilience and system stresses. So, taking our friend, the yellow rumped warbler, as a starting point, and taking one historical archive as a starting point, I um, charted the, all of the relevant ecosystem elements that were mentioned in this one archive. So, it's just a starting point. And this data is just totally test data. It's just like imagining what this is going to begin to look like. Um, uh, and so I began charting those elements of the species and the habitat and their interactions, such as migrations and predation and so on. And then I thought about, well, okay, so what will happen then? What are the other elements that are relevant here? And I started to imagine um, the effect of human development, shifts in land use, our culture, communications. And then through all of this, can we begin to understand what will happen in the case of stresses to these networks or ecosystems, stresses like climate change, invasives, future development, et cetera. 